Welcome to the Startup Grind. Just talk about, uh, you know, where are you, uh, where are you from, where did you grow up, and uh, what did your mom and do, dad do for a living? Sure. Shilpi, first of all, thank you for, uh, for having me, and uh, everyone, uh, good evening. Uh, it's, it's a joy to sort of be here and, uh, and see this, uh, this uh, great organization sort of come together uh, in Fremont. So happy to support and happy to sort of be here. Uh, my wife is sitting in the audience, so everyone can say hi. She works for City of Fremont. Uh, oh. So we've really been connected with Fremont for a long time. Um, <clears throat> I grew up in India. I uh, grew up in uh, actually in, in, in a small state, which is actually the largest state in, 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 uh, in India, but it's become smaller now because it's been chopped up into two parts uh, called Uttar Pradesh. And um, my mother and father both had a very uh, core focus and education, which you find with a lot of Indian families. So I was um, always in uh, what are called English medium schools in India and, uh, and was always in really good schools. So I was lucky to, to be there. But uh, I grew up being transferred every two or three years into a different town. And uh, that obviously got me used to being able to transition very quickly. And that's translated today where in the last 25 years of being in Silicon Valley, you know, I started my career working for Intel doing heavy database work for chip design, and today I help women sell shoes, and that transition couldn't have happened, I think, without sort of this rapid fire ability to adapt. The second thing that happened in this rapid fire adaptation was uh, typically instead of losing school years, I gained school years. So I was able to finish my high school at the age of 15, and uh, went uh, and did my undergrad in computer science, and then came to US, landed in Texas uh, at the age of 19. Wow, that, that actually I have, we have so much in common. I did my 10th uh, as well when I was 14 and a half. Wow. And uh, we, I'm from UP too. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I can see my future is bright. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of uh, you know, your entrepreneurship journey, you talked about you know, being in that uh, rapid changing environment that really helped you what you are today. But when did you realize that you really want to be an entrepreneur? <clears throat> so um, it's a few seminal points, you know, as I was uh, growing up, my grandfather was a pharmacist in, uh, in Delhi. And um, from the age of seven or eight, I used to spend summers with him. And India at that time was such an interesting place in the sense that we would just be left in his shop the whole day and we would roam around the bazaars of, uh, of Delhi at eight or nine, and I think that was sort of part of the imbibing. Uh, but from that on, my, my father was a judge, so I was just you know, sort of on a straight career track. And then later on, um, I ended up getting inspired by my, by my father-in-law, who was also a serial entrepreneur, much later. So actually, I would say I'm a, in some ways a late blooming entrepreneur, because I didn't start my first company at 17, 18, 20, 21, 25, missed all those chances. It was really only in the mid-30s that I actually ended up starting my first company. So I was almost a veteran of startups by that time. I, I agree. I think uh, the trend is changing these days, right? And um, kids are in college, and I, especially in India, I'm seeing this trend. They're still in college, and their co-founders are four companies. Not sure what they're working, but they're, they're just trying to be really entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. Things are changing now. Uh, so in terms of, we, I talked about a little bit what Poshmark is, and Manish said that he's selling shoes. Uh, so let's know more about what exactly is Poshmark. Is it a mobile app? Is it an e-commerce company? It is a community of fashionistas, you know, selling luxury, buying luxury, or it's a, it's a marketplace like eBay. So uh, I would like to know from you what exactly you build. Uh, the answer, Shilpi, is yes, 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 and yes. It is actually all of those things. It, it is a community-driven uh, mobile fashion marketplace. Today, uh, primarily targeted at women. Uh, we plan to launch other categories like kids and men's over the course of the next few quarters. Um, the approach that we took to building Poshmark was quite different. Um, <clears throat> and that's really was my learning from my previous company, which was Caboodle, where uh, Caboodle's journey was much more an accident where I was building enterprise software, uh, had built sort of complex database software, application software, e-commerce platforms. 
but had no idea uh, what to do when it came to consumers. We were remodeling our home right here in Fremont, and there were uh, challenges in remodeling our home and the shopping required, and that's what led to the creation of Caboodle. Caboodle, uh, for those of you who are probably not familiar with it today, because it sort of came and got acquired by Hearst and slowly uh, has become, you know, kind of a, a, a historical mark today, is very much like Pinterest. So it was a sharing community primarily geared towards women, where women were sharing shopping finds with actually started with home but ended up becoming much more focused on uh, fashion. And that was the thesis for Hearst acquiring it. It was effectively a user-created digital magazine uh, created for, uh, for women, by women, uh, and ultimately became a very lively community. So there was a lot of stuff I learned, uh, as Malcolm Gladwell says, you know, that was sort of my 10,000 hours of hmm. uh, learning communities and also learning women's fashion uh, as a space. And um, when I started Poshmark, we applied similar principles. And Poshmark is very first driven by community. Uh, and it's authentic, and we've taken a lot of effort to keep it authentic. Um, the second thing is, the lesson I learned from Caboodle was, whenever engagement in a consumer platform doesn't directly lead to monetization, then you have to slap monetization models, which can actually take a toll on your engagement. And uh, some of that is what happened with Hearst, where we were slapping three ad units on a single page and pretty much killing the, the core experience. In Poshmark, engagement drives monetization. Because it's a marketplace, everything that's available is available for sale, but it's also available to, to share your love. So in Poshmark, the ruling philosophy is that it's all about love. And if you focus on love, it creates money. But if you focus on money, nothing, you know, you destroy everything. So that sort of symbiotic cycle of love creating money, creating love creating money, is very endemic to Poshmark's core philosophy. And that ultimately leads to a much healthier business model because engagement leads to monetization, leads to engagement. So as a business, you can focus on engagement. And as your engagement deepens, your monetization grows. So for example, one of the stats with Poshmark that we are very proud of is day one when we started Poshmark, our average active user used to spend 20 to 25 minutes a day in the app. And she opened the app seven to nine times. Three and a half years later, with millions of users, that stat is still true. Our average active user still opens the app 20 to 25 minutes, uh, or spends 20 to 25 minutes a day in the app and opens the app seven to nine times a day. So that deep engagement is something you can't manipulate, you can't pay for. It has to be built as part of the core engagement. And if you can make it scale, it becomes really a powerful thing. The second thing which is really core uh, to, to the whole experience is remaining sort of very upfront and simple about commerce. So we made certain decisions about how commerce is going to operate in the platform, which were simple. We have a flat shipping fee. There's an upfront transaction fee, and it is disclosed day one. You pay 20%, which is higher than most other platforms on the surface. In reality, it's actually lower than most other platforms, but most often people hide the fees in a bunch of things, and so it becomes very confusing. Also, it destroys the customer experience. So we took a very high ground there, which was risky. But in three and a half years, our competitors have come and gone. Different models have been tried against Poshmark. We haven't touched it. And the reason is because it's the model that works. It's super simple. And people who love complexity can go and deal with complexity, but most people like to have their life simple. And then the third thing is a core philosophy inside the company and in the platform of love and respect. That means that every woman who comes in, no matter what her closet is, no matter what her fashion style is, no matter who she is, is shown the same love and respect. And if you don't, you are thrown out of the platform. Mm. So that, those sort of values are very endemic to creating something scalable over time. So this is very interesting. Like when we think of a uh, topic like fashion and what <laughs> women want, right? It's, it's the tougher one if we think of a man starting a company about what women really want in fashion <laughs> and how the experience should be, right? I think I would think of women doing a better job, but the way your company has grown, right? From it started to where you are and how you're leading the category. It's, it's amazing to see that, how did you even think about it, right? So is it because, how did, where did you see these challenges? And where did you figure out that, oh, you are the one who can solve this? 
So getting an idea is one thing, but creating that consumer experience and thinking about what are the right features to bake into that product, because that is the first thing, you know, and the first time uh, entrepreneur is thinking of a mobile app or a product, we generally think, oh, there are 10,000 features. And I, I do the research and I figure out, oh, the company A is doing these 10 things, B is doing these 20, so I should build all 30, right? So how, that, how do we get away from that temptation of me too and building something which everybody has, rather picking something what you stuck to, right? Okay, these are the five things. I'll keep it simple and I'll keep it like, you know, three or four, five things, but build the consumer engagement. So how did you even able to grasp that idea and keep yourself focused? And um, knowing women, how did you do that? So where did you find your pilot customers? So, uh, <clears throat> you know, I think of Poshmark as almost a 10-year journey started with the foundation of uh, Caboodle. So we made a lot of mistakes in Caboodle. We started Caboodle as a very simple platform, and then over time, we did make the mistakes of as the platform evolved, time passed on, competitors showed up, and they were getting different kinds of traction of starting to add features to, to Caboodle. Uh, and, and those features ended up corrupting the platform over time, which slowed down the growth because at the end, the features are demanded by the more advanced user, mm -hmm. but growth comes from the early users. So by actually adding features, you're satisfying the vocal minority, but you're going to ultimately sacrifice growth because the new guy who comes in, they're going to still love the same simple thing that everyone else loved the day one that you started the platform. Um, so, so then the question is, you know, how do you sort of evolve the platform and how do you avoid the temptation? I think we've done a pretty decent job at Poshmark. I wouldn't say it's like A++. I would give ourselves an A- minus today mm -hmm. uh, uh, in terms of uh, temptation to add features. The platform that I would say gets an A++ is Dropbox. And uh, that's sort of my gold standard of how to avoid the temptation of features. And uh, in fact, for the longest time, they had nothing. Like many features that you would think are so logical. The number one feature on their forum used to be uh, creating subfolders and being able to do selective sync. And I was like a big complainer as to why don't you have selective sync. They launched it, I never use it. Mm -hmm. right? It's actually more complicated to figure out what's syncing up to each platform <laughs> than syncing the whole damn thing. And this became cheaper, so it became immaterial. Um, in Poshmark, for example, we've had so much feedback to add categories to add different shipping tiers, to nuance the commission rate, to add private messaging. And for the longest time, we have done nothing. In fact, our category stack is still the same that was there three and a half years back. We are getting ready to launch a whole bunch of new categories, but that's after three and a half years. The entire metadata system, we didn't touch. We haven't touched our shipping system. We haven't touched our uh, commerce system, our return system, nothing. Um, people asked us to do ratings. So after three years, I succumbed to actually do ratings on the platform. And then they asked us to not publish the ratings. <laughs> Interesting. And so we went back to, fortunately, we went back to exactly what we wanted to do, which was always part of the original vision to not have ratings but have love notes. Because the reason is it goes back to the core of our platform. When a woman is actually putting her closet online, it's very different than opening your store. It's very different than putting your junk on Craigslist. Fashion for women is, is a very different sort of pursuit. It's very personal. It ties into the top three uh, Maslow's hierarchy of ego. It's very core to what she thinks about herself. So when she gets a bad rating in a closet, mm. it's almost as if somebody slapped her entire style and put a slap on her face. And that powerful feeling is a feeling that you never want to create. And you can still build a fashion business despite that, right? But you will get few sellers and a lot of buyers. So you'll actually get towards the more professional buyers because the consumer seller will not interact. Mm -hmm. Today we have over 800,000 sellers on our platform. Just to give you a sense, Etsy today has 1.4 million sellers after, I don't know, nine years, 10 years. After three years, Primarily being actually an iPhone company, we only launched Android 18 months back, and you can't sell on the web. We have over 800,000 sellers. Today, in one week, our seller community uploads what is the equivalent of a Nordstrom fashion store. 
uh, on Poshmark. Uh, our women, our top sellers today, are doing north of half a million dollars a year in sales. Yet, if you're a new seller, there's higher than 70% chance that within the first two weeks you're gonna make your first sale. And so how do you sort of orchestrate all of these things? You gotta focus on the simple principles, and those principles you can't change. And that's why you have to keep the simplicity of the core platform. This is actually, this is eye-opening, what you just told me. And I, I completely agree that temptation of adding features because your most vocal consumers are asking for it. It's, I think it, it takes a lot of guts to say no to that. But how did you figure that out, that, you know, that, that concept of that, you know, uh, women selling luxury online is that, you know, if you give the ra rating to them, then uh, it's going to be a slap on their own, you know, their own choice and personality. So is it, was it a, a painful way to learning it, or you figured it out before you even uh, did the rating system? So did you know about it before that? I did. I learned it uh, at Caboodle. So Caboodle, we started with three guys. There was no girls involved in, in starting the company. We hired the first woman um, almost a year after we started the company. Um, I remember Elisa, who joined my company, said, Manish, your product is like the Lucky Magazine. I, knew, I did not know what Lucky Magazine was. <laughs> I did not know what she was talking about. So I went and bought a copy of the Lucky Magazine, which, by the way, is defunct today. It, it got folded in with Beach Mint, and the editor of Lucky Magazine just joined Facebook as head of Instagram fashion, which is what tells you in 10 years how the world has evolved. Uh, so from that point onwards to the time we actually, I left Caboodle, we were almost 70% women, uh, and more than half of my e-staff was women. Uh, in Poshmark today, we are 80% women. Um, in fact, a third of our Eng team is women, and certainly more than two-thirds of my e-staff is, is, is women. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things we learned in the, in the Caboodle days in terms of just understanding, you know, how communities are built, what is sort of the core, uh, core demographic, and how fashion sort of interacts with women. And there's so many sort of reasons why fashion has not scaled online. Mm -hmm. So my, my core passion is, when you think of fashion as an industry, it's kind of very interesting. It's a $1.2 trillion global business. $350 billion in US. Unlike most other businesses, the largest player in fashion in the world has less than 4.2% global market share, which is pretty crazy. Yet that company is worth over $150 billion. The net margin of the top 25 fashion businesses is north of 20%, which is Apple and Google. And so, and in each sector, simultaneously, there are eight winners who are each worth over $50 billion. So when you think of fast fashion, H&M, Zara, Uniqlo, Forever 21, all simultaneously, and, and Primark are all simultaneous winners. Each of them does anywhere from 10 to $25 billion a year in GMV and are worth somewhere between 35 to $80 billion each. Some of them are actually worth $100 billion. So it's a very, very different kind of a business. And the largest companies are created either through vertical integration or aggregation of brands. And this is something you may not know, is that the largest fashion company in the world is run by an electrical engineer. So I'm well qualified as a computer science <laughs> engineer, right? LVMH is founded as an electrical engineer by training, and his first job was doing real estate development in Miami. Hmm. So it's something, you know, the owner of Louis Vuitton did real estate in Miami, so you know I did real estate in Fremont, so you know. <laughs> quite cool. um, but but the foundation of Poshmark is really built on those principles, and if algorithms and supply chain could solve online fashion problem, then Amazon and eBay's fashion businesses would be ten times bigger than they are. I agree. Amazon has actually spent more money trying to build fashion than their total GMV in fashion today. It's one area they're growing fast, but it's still tiny for them, and they are attacking in every which way. My belief is that ultimately to drive fashion, you have to empower the individual. And actually there's one macro data point when you look at fashion is that 35% of fashion in America, where big chains are taking over everything, 
is still sold through small individual stores, right? And the reason is because, and this is going to be another sort of psychographic of women, and so pardon all the women in the room, <laughs> is uh, when a woman is thinking of buying a yellow dress, right, she's really not thinking of buying a yellow dress. She's actually thinking of an outfit for a date night, for a girl's night out, for a wedding, for a weekend, which means she could walk into a store with a vision of a yellow dress, walk out with a pink romper, and she's extremely happy. Never going to happen to a guy. If he's thinking of a blue dress, he's really thinking of a blue shirt. He's thinking of a blue shirt. There's no doubt about it. If he doesn't find a blue shirt, he's going to be very frustrated. <laughs> so how do you build a search algorithm that maps a yellow dress to a pink romper? How do you do that? You can only do that with human beings. And what we've done in our platform, and that's why it's all of those things that you mentioned, Shilpi, is we've empowered every one of our 800,000 sellers, if they choose to, to also be a seller stylist. So not only do they upload inventory of the level of a Nordstrom, every day they share more than a million items which are curated and they act as curators of these items to their followers. The combination of those two engines drives the entire commerce uh, in Poshmark and provides liquidity not just to the major brands, which you can, Tory Burch, Louis Vuitton, but also to unbranded merchandise. More than half our sales are items that have no brand or small brands. We sell over 5,000 brands, 3,500 of them most of you won't recognize, so they're effectively unbranded. Okay. And that's something that's been impossible to do online and happens every day in smaller boutiques. That's sort of the magical success of Poshmark is ultimately empowering the individual. Wow. Yeah, actually when you were talking about it, I was thinking from a, as being a founder of a company, like you don't have to build all the features. You have to just empower your consumer of the application to make use of that application in such a way that half of the feature you don't have to build, your consumers can do that automatically. And the day that happens, the scale comes from there, right? You are not spending money. You are just giving them. You giving them enough, enough features to work with. They'll just make something out of it. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So I think one thing I wanted to ask you. You like you said you were I, you know iPhone app company for such a long time, and you were mobile first, and now recently, a few months back, you gave Apple Watch to every one of your employee. Um, so would love to know that how do you bet on technology and. Uh, what makes you think that you, know, you should think on uh, variables right now while nobody is touching it in terms of fashion business? I think um, <clears throat> there's two things that have driven sort of uh, the evolution and adoption of technology. One is speed of communication. So anything that expedites the speed of communication between human beings. And the second is uh, effectively what I would say uh, deeper, more immersive engagement. And Apple Watch you know, is not an immersive engagement device, but it has the potential to speed up uh, conversations dramatically. The reason we bet on the phone early on and didn't choose the web is one of the core things that I saw, particularly in the millennials, you know, I was 42, well, how, was, how old was I, 40, 41, 42, or, or even older when I started this company. And at that level, to actually start a mobile app is hard because we're not the users at that age in the same way. So how do you, do, how do you sort of start a mobile app in that, uh, in that format? One of the decisions I made in 2010 when I was starting to sort of think that I want to do something here is I actually quit using laptops for six months. And I did everything on the phone. It was really hard because the apps were not ready trying to go through the mobile web experiences was terrible, but it was a commitment. It was like do or die. If I couldn't do it, it'd be hard to sort of imagine a Poshmark that would be all mobile. But that taught me a lot of things uh, in that sort of process. Back in Caboodle days, I had an experience when I was sort of in my late 30s, there was a woman who was our community manager who was maybe 26, 27. I would send her email, she would never respond. I was like, here's a CEO sending email, I would get no response. And one day somebody sent me a text message <laughs> and I sent her a text message and I got an instant response. And that was sort of my DNA into the fact that the communication paradigm when you start to go younger is changing. Email is not the format. 
So when you go back to sort of looking at Poshmark, everything in Poshmark, every sort of comment and interaction, today is sort of very obvious because we are all used to WhatsApp and everything, but four and a half years back, the fact that everything was just an SMS kind of a feeling and not an email and you could instantly respond to it, change the velocity and liquidity of a marketplace. Because suddenly, instead of saying, hey, what's this color, became, oh, it's red, you know, what's the big deal? Like, I can just answer it, tap it. Or, can you show me how it's worn? Well, I can always take a selfie. Every girl is trained to take a selfie, so she puts it on. So that changed the return rate. Our return rate of the products is less than 2.2%. Wow. And the reason is because a lot of that happens because girls will model the item or give extra details of the item or post extra photos on demand because it's so easy. It's extremely cheap with mobile phone to do that. So creating that paradigm made it much easier. And then the third thing is we set an editorial tone early on where all of the photos in the early days were modeled. And so that created a much more livelier thing where instead of using stock photos, et cetera. Of course, today at the scale that we are at, you'll see a hybrid. But that still created that liveliness where, as you were browsing through Poshmark, my vision was always it felt like a fashion magazine. And that sort of tone is still very much there. And we never used stock photos, we never used SLR photos. Everything was done in the iPhone, which meant that your photo was never much more superior to mine. Everyone had sort of the same chance of creating an amazing photo. Once you set that tone, then it's actually easier. The last piece which is there is that mobile actually proved to be the inflection point for social. So social was interesting on the web, but mobile became really powerful. And the reason is very simply this. How many times do you open your phone in a day, right? A bazillion times. Some of you are probably on your phone right now. Mm -hmm. And the reason is every time you sort of, you're, you tune out, you open your phone, right? Now, no editorial engine can actually keep up with the phone. It's just impossible. Editors cannot produce the stories. They just cannot do that. So when you look at the top 10, 15 apps in every category, you'll find that 70, 80% of them are effectively social apps of some form, where the velocity of content is very, very, very high. Mm -hmm. And that's why the top seven apps today are Kylie Jenner, ignore that, <laughs> Snapchat, Facebook Messenger, Facebook, uh, Instagram, Pinterest, WhatsApp, a couple of social games, right? And Kylie Jenner is super social too. So you know, you sort of look at all of these apps and it ends up becoming that core thing, which means New York Times for all its powerful content, Wall Street Journal for all its powerful content is never going to be able to achieve that, which also starts to challenge powerful institutions like Google, you know, given the amount of money they've spent in Google Plus, et cetera, and starts to put Facebook in the center of the universe. Starts to put a company like Snapchat threatening Facebook's you know, power uh, because it's geared towards mobile. So as you're thinking about your mobile paradigms, if you're not thinking social and you can't get that social engine happening, you will never have a highly engaging platform. You'll have to think of a different architecture. It doesn't mean you can't build a great product, but you won't get that top sort of billing uh, in the system. Actually, those, those are really good points. I think thinking about social, like what you were thinking about mobile, if the social part is missing, I think you can't get the 100% out of it. And it's, it's something which uh, a lot of us, if we are building on a new app, it's very important to think about that aspect too. That how do you bring social without forcing it to on your consumer? Yes. It should be very seamless, very intuitive. It doesn't have to be that you're doing it for the heck of it. Right? That's yes. one thing I think once I learned that if I start stuffing features, just to make it look like it, it, it seems it's social or it's something very similar, it just, it'll just take your you know, consumer away. You won't get engagement. Yeah. You won't get the engagement. So one thing you talked about, um, one last question on Poshmark I would like to ask, and before I, I had a lot of questions about your entrepreneurship experience, but I think I'll open up first for the questions, if the audience has those questions. If, uh, if there are many, then otherwise I'll go back to questions after that. So, you talked about millennials, and when we think of, uh, like, while well, I was, um, I, and by the way, I have a profile on Rent the Renovate too. So Rent the Renovate is the company where, you know, you build your profile, you rent luxury fashion, uh, like $1,500 gown and $100 for four days, 
So if the trend is going that side, which is mostly millennials are following, don't you think that's going to affect a business like Poshmark where the assumption is that there is an inventory of luxury goods? If people so you know, in the next four years, they stop buying luxury and they just start renting, how are you planning for those kind of trends? So I think the trend that is happening is a loose sense of ownership and a much deeper connection to the experience. And that's going to translate, translate to rentals. It translates to a Poshmark paradigm. It translates to Uber. It translates to Airbnb, uh, et cetera. And, uh, you know, if rental became the core demographic, I actually don't think it will for a variety of reasons uh, because effectively the platform like Poshmark subsumes rentals in a deeper way mm -hmm. without the commitment. Um, and Rent the Runway, by the way, is moving towards more an ownership model as part of their business expansion. Uh, so the models are, are, are overlapping, but I don't think, I don't think anyway, there's any danger of that happening. However, what millennials do want to do uh, at a very core level, and, and it's not just millennial, it's sort of, I forget what the next generation is called, but because millennials are actually all getting older now. <laughs> um, and and the, the real one, like my 16-year-old daughter is not a millennial, she's something else. And, and what, what it is, is I would say more fun and less commitment. Sounds kind of dirty, but that's really where life is heading, mm -hmm. right? And that's why Snapchat is starting to transcend Instagram. And that sort of, what, what that means is that there's sort of a comfort in the overall infrastructure where we can casually engage with the world, rules are very well laid out, and then we can disengage. And that opens up so many different opportunities in terms of so many different things. And by the way, it actually empowers America more than it empowers other countries because of all the power we have. Because if the power is moving towards manufacturing, then it disempowers us. Because we're not going to be able to manufacture anything as cheaper as anything else. But we are masters at distribution. We are masters at individual empowerments. And we have some of the best infrastructure. So this paradigm inherently favors America and Americans in a core way. So, I mean, I, there's probably like 55 opportunities that are there that I can think of just off the top of my head, which leverage all of these trends. The, the core thing is when you look at an opportunity, if you can abstract the offline pieces, which are the grungy pieces. So in our cases, we abstracted shipping payments. By the way, for shipping, just to tell you an interesting story, I almost went to jail. Because we took a bet on shipping where we said, we want a girl who's selling her dress. The first thing she shouldn't do is to put that dress on a weighing scale. She doesn't want to do that. That beautiful prom dress, you don't want to just crumple it up and put it on a weighing scale. If you don't do it, how do you ship it? It's impossible to ship a dress without that because there's no shipping system that supports that. So we created a shipping system that supported that where basically you could use any size box and put almost any set of items in it, slap our label and ship it. Nothing existed, so we hacked it. When we hacked it, we created disruption for USPS, which was okay in the early days, but as the business grew 10x, we had postal inspectors come to my office and wanted me to write them a multi-million dollar check or they would arrest me. And the multi-million dollar check was for all the overages our customers were having on the, the platform. The challenge was that most of the packages had huge underages. So if you average them out, we were actually overpaying the USPS for, our, for those labels. But they couldn't, they couldn't compensate me for the underage, but they had to arrest me for the overage. For the overage. So that led to then us being able to go to the postmaster general. And that led to creation of our new shipping label, which we launched 18 months back, which has become one of the fastest growing uh, postal paradigms to the a degree that this year's keynote that Postmaster General did to all the postmasters across the country featured Poshmark as the prime example of how postal service can reinvent because nobody's selling, sending uh, packages today, uh, sorry, sending postal letters today, but Poshmark enables packages to go from anywhere to every, anywhere. Wow. And because of the mass distribution, the number of sellers we're enabling, there's a possibility that you can actually have packages going out at the same velocity as you had letters going out. Wow. What an inspiring way of uh, doing I Like, a lot of times when you're trying to solve problem, I think this is one of the most innovative ones I've heard, where you went out of your way and thought of a solution, which is, again, which is uh, not very really traditional, right? No, 
as an entrepreneur, you won't like to get meddled with uh, USPS of, Amer of, of a country and try to fight with them on something. Um, so with that, I think I will uh, stop asking questions right now and I'll open up for, for the floor. If there are any specific questions you would like to ask, please raise your hand and uh, ask questions to Manish. There's one other thing I want to say. Um, one thing that I do at the beginning of every year is I write a dream page which effectively says what my business is going to look like circa December of that year. And half the things come true, half the things don't come true. But what's the funny thing is, at the beginning of 2014, I had written a note saying, wouldn't it be amazing that Postmaster General personally would be delivering a keynote that featured Poshmark? Literally, I don't know, 15 months later, it would actually come true. So you basically make it work, right? You, you have to visualize have to. what the end game is every time. You cannot leave it to chance. This, this is great. So uh, Manish, just the parting thoughts, if there is anybody uh, thinking of starting a company, so what would, uh, there's, if there's one advice you have to give a first time entrepreneur, what would be that? My only advice would be think big. Inside every small business is a massive business. And really, no matter what your idea is, it's worth a billion dollars. Every single one of you has a billion dollar idea inside the brain. And the classic example I always give is the guy who looked at a coffee cup and created a $10 billion empire when everyone else thought was coffee was just a cup of coffee, right? And I just had one of his products for $4.69, <laughs> which nobody could have imagined paying $4.69 for something that doesn't even resemble coffee, it's a pack of sugar. So if he can do it, taking a coffee shop with a naked mermaid certainly every one of your ideas can become a billion dollars. So that would be my main advice. Thank you, Manish. I would like to thank you all of you and Manish for taking time. I used to think that Manish still lives in Fremont. He moved out. So he lives in San Jose now for some time and he specially made a stop to come here. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, so have a round of applause for Manish.